Welcome. Welcome all. Okay, so while everyone's coming in, I'm going to go ahead and start our introduction so that we don't uh, run too late. Uh, again, welcome uh, to the University of Chicago virtually. Um, we are the Graham School, which is the great gateway to the incredible ideas of this university for intellectually curious adults everywhere. Um, and my name is Zoe Eisenman, and I'm the Director of Academics for the Graham School, and I'm sitting in for our Dean, Seth Green, who's unfortunately out ill, um, but I'll be hosting today. And um, I want to just go through a brief introduction about our program, and then I will start our introduce our speakers and start our program. Um, uh, as I said, we're now 132 years into this mission, the first of its kind in our country to extend the big ideas of this university to all learners and to really make sure that the cutting edge ideas that are here at the university are accessible to the world at large. For those of you who are not familiar with Graham, we're proud to have four program areas. Our Master of Liberal Arts, which is one of the most rigorous and respected in the world, where you work across all divisions of the university. The basic program, where you're able to immerse yourself in the great books of Western social and political thought and literature in a classroom that is committed to the Socratic tradition. Our open enrollment program, where you can explore non-credit courses across all disciplines and where you can experience the joy and camaraderie of learning with others. And then we also have a set of annual programs that allow you to better know Chicago and even to deepen your understanding of museum publishing. Uh, registration for our winter courses uh, in open enrollment uh, and non-credit programs is open now and will close December 29th at 5 p.m. Central Time. And you can find uh, the link to our non-credit course search in the chat. And in this season of giving, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our Graham Circle members and our many friends for their ongoing support of our mission at Graham. But the reason you're here today is to hear from our exciting speakers, uh, Ada Palmer and Joe Walton. So I'm gonna stop sharing this and uh, talk about them a little bit. Um, to introduce Ada Palmer, Ada Palmer is a historian focusing on the history of censorship and radical thought, especially the way censorship evolves and changes during revolutions in information technology, from the print revolution to the digital an associate professor in the history department with affiliations in classics, gender studies, and the Institute on the Formation of Knowledge. She works broadly on the history of science, religion, heresy, free thought, atheism, censorship, books, printing, and long-term European history, especially the Renaissance and Enlightenment. Her current research focuses on how studying the print revolution can help lawmakers and corporations make wiser choices today during the digital revolution while her first academic book, Reading Lucretius and the Renaissance, explores the impact of the rediscovery, rediscovery of classical atomism on the development of modern science and thought. She is also a science fiction and fantasy novelist, as is gonna be very apparent today, um, author of the award-winning Terra Ignota series, four volumes beginning with Two Like the Lightning from Tor Books, which explores a 25th century civilization of voluntary citizenship and borderless nations, written in the style of an 18th century philosophical novel. She is a disability activist with a focus on self-care training and invisible disability, a composer of polyphonic a cappella music, study and studies anime and manga, works as a consultant for anime and manga publishers, blogs for tour.com, and writes the history, philosophy, and travel blog, exurbe.com, which hosts her recent essay on the question, if the Black Death caused the Renaissance, will not COVID-19 cause a golden age? And her celebrated guide on to how to find good gelato anywhere in the world, once featured in The Economist. So very much to welcome Ada Palmer, and let me go ahead and uh, spotlight you so people can see you. And then um, our other speaker today uh, is Joe Walton. And Joe Walton has published 15 novels, most recently, Or What You Will. She's also published three poetry collections, two essay collections, and a short story collection. She won the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer in 2000, 2002, the World Fantasy Award for Tooth and Claw in 2004, the Hugo and Nebula Awards for Among Others in 2012, and in 2014, both the Tip Tree Award for My Real Children and the Locus Nonfiction Award for What Makes This Book So Great. 
She comes from Wales, but lives in Montreal, where the food and books are much better. <laughs> she gets bored easily, so she tends to write books that are different from each other. She also reads a lot, enjoys travel, talking about books, and eating great food. She plans to live to be 99 and write a book every year, and we wish her all success with those plans. <laughs> Um, so now I'm going to hand things over to Ada and Joe to talk about the history of science fiction. Great. Thank you for the excellent introductions and welcome. It's fantastic to see so many exciting people and also from so many different places, which is one of the joys of online learning. Uh, so we've been uh, we're excited to have a community that's spreading this conversation broadly. Joe and I were excited to propose this course, partly because we are currently working on a collection of our essays about the craft of writing, uh, focusing on science fiction and fantasy, looking at the history of you know, practices within the genre, the formation of the genre, the publishing process. You know, I bring my book history lens to it. So I'm always, you know, what are the printing presses doing? What are the tech changes doing in terms of enabling different types of, of books to be produced at different points? So one of the essays that we're uh, going to be sharing with you in this course, for example, is a history of science fiction publishing, uh, which goes all the way back to the classical period <laughs> and has a long, when Gutenberg did, blah, blah, because you need Gutenberg to understand why there are pulp paperbacks, uh, or at least you do eventually. So uh, that's that's part of the spirit of why we wanted to propose this. And separately, Joe is also working on a history of science fiction genre, uh, the book uh, provisionally titled How to Love Science Fiction. Uh, so I thought it would be fun to share those ongoing projects and discussions that Joe and I enjoy having with each other as two writers who are good friends uh, about the history of the genre that we both write in, but also separately from writing in it, really enjoy nerding out about the history of. Yeah, that's 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 very true. Uh, and <laughs> I thought that it would be it would be fun to get you to read a bunch of stuff so that we could talk to you about it and also to talk about what I call the project of science fiction, because unlike a lot of genres, science fiction was started with, uh, with a plan, with an agenda of trying to shape the future, which it both has and hasn't done uh, in really interesting ways. Uh, so there are certainly science fiction books that have really changed the world, but they're not particularly the ones that were written by the people who were part of the project to try to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and so it's very fun to look at how they had big ambitions and they had big impact, but the two were often not quite in alignment with each other in a way that's that's fun to examine. You know, when we talk about science fiction changing the world, we talk about things like the its influence on the way we think about technology, uh, the way we depict technology, and also uh, moments of political decision making. Um, science fiction often speculates about the potential impact of big technological, scientific, and in many cases also social changes, and gives us kinds of previews of what it could be like which often then have a real and serious impact on the debates that go on in the legislation or uh, overseeing of these technologies as they genuinely roll out. Many of us will remember when Dolly the Cloned Sheep first existed. And we had, you know, many, many hundreds of thousands of pages about the potential bad uses of cloning well before we had cloning. And as people discussed and speculated about how this will be used, how it can impact civil rights, how it can be good, how it can be bad, science fiction existing as a genre means that when we get to new moments like that, when there are new moments of ethical considerations for an innovation, we've already previewed them in a way that earlier centuries hadn't. When earlier centuries have a moment of first contact across the Atlantic, or the moment of the arrival of industrialization or other uh, major touchstone tech changes. They plunge into it and then they see what the impacts are, then they evaluate them. But ever since the 20th century uh, development of science fiction, science fiction lets us have our moral debate before we get to the point that we have to deploy it. <laughs> 
so that before the gardening company developed a slug eating robot, I kid you not, it's a little robot that goes around your garden, finds slugs, kills them, dehydrates them, burns them in a little forest furnace and powers itself by consuming the corpses of dead animals that it has killed <laughs> everyone was like so the matrix and we were like yes we've discussed this in advance and why it's not a good idea to make a robot that is programmed to hunt kill and, dis and feed on the corpses of animals let's think this through more carefully yeah, <laughs> yeah and uh sort of very very specifically robert heinlein wrote a uh, solution unsatisfactory about the problems of nuclear weapons uh before there were any nuclear weapons mm -hmm. so that the the whole uh, mutually assured destruction issue and the question of what you would do was being discussed in uh astounding magazine uh at the very very beginning of the second world war before there was a nuclear program and there was one point where john campbell the editor was visited by the fbi and told to stop talking about this stuff uh, <laughs> and that was the point where the manhattan project was being set up uh and so the, there was a silence about it that suddenly fell at the moment when it became potentially real which is just a, a nifty interesting thing um mm -hmm. And you, you get that. And I, I sometimes use that example when people talk about science fiction as escapism. I say, yeah, it means that we got to worry about things early. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's fun to look at our, you know, there's lots of very interesting documented evidence for this kind of impact. And I'll give three quick examples. And then we had in the chat the great question about the term science fiction versus the term speculative fiction, which I'd love to jump to after the, the three quick uh, quick fun examples. So in the archives of the University of Chicago are the archives of the Bulletin of Atomic Science, the ones that still maintain the doomsday clock uh, and so on. And I've looked through their records because they engage a lot with government censorship and, and governments, you know, not wanting them to be able to share science beyond uh, beyond a local community because of the military's desire to have proprietary tech. This is mostly documents from the 40s through 80s. Uh, but in those documents, you can see them discussing science fiction stories that one of them has read in Asimov's uh, and, and is speculating about so that the, the very people who are not only developing the science, but the leaders of trying to be the public outreach about the science and, and guide the way the world thinks about nuclear threats and also censorship threats, were directly consuming and thinking about and chewing on uh, the pulp magazine short stories that were being poured out by uh, scientists. More recently, um, there's an interview with one of the UK's head uh, health ministers in which he says that at the very beginning of the COVID uh, epidemic, they were given the option to pre-order vaccines and that then he watched a science fiction movie about an epidemic and then he ordered 11 million more doses of vaccine because the movie had depicted vaccine scarcity and everybody rushing to get it. And 11 million more people in the UK were able to be vaccinated earlier uh, and the vaccines got more funding because of that movie. And that was not actually a very particularly innovative movie, but sometimes it's the third order derivative SF that's, that's drawing on other stuff that's nonetheless the one that makes it all the way to the impact. Um, I also had the fascinating personal experience as a science fiction writer in 2016 to receive emails when that was when my first novel had just came out. And I got an email from a po po political intern who was with Hillary's campaign saying, you know, I'm here in the van with Hillary and I have your novel and I'm reading it. We're passing it around in the van and we all really love it. And then I got an email from an intern with the Trump campaign saying, I have a copy of your novel and I'm in the van with Trump and we're passing it around and all reading it and enjoying it. Uh, and even if the candidate doesn't read it, the fact that the people who are talking with the people who are talking with the candidate, it's right there. And it's, it's really neat to think about the fact that science fiction manages to get these very rich, uh, these very rich conversations out into a lot of oddball corners where they influence business, policy, government, all sorts of stuff, as well as us in our own decision making as to whether we buy a slug eating robot. 
course, of course, science fiction doesn't predict everything. There are loads and loads of things that science fiction never thought of and never predicted and that come along as a complete surprise. And I always say that science fiction isn't preparing you for the future that's in the book, which will always be wrong. But if you read lots and lots of science fiction books, it prepares you for whatever future will come along, which won't be like any of them, but which might have aspects of all of them. But you will just have thought about more things from reading a bunch of science fiction, some of it awful. <laughs> and that, that will just put you in a different place with reference to thinking about the real world as it becomes the present and as it changes. It's not especially, prediction. Yeah, especially because one of the things that speculative fiction more broadly does, or any fiction that's about the world being different, is it introduces you to the world being different. And when we read a hundred stories that are set in a hundred different worlds that either aren't Earth or are variations on Earth, it helps us prepare for the fact that Earth five years from now is not going to be the Earth we know in a way that past generations didn't, right? Somebody in Jane Austen's generation, somebody in Machiavelli's generation, other than big era changes like fall of the Roman Empire, generally all the worlds that they imaginatively inhabit are versions of Earth very, very close to their own. We all have the experience of visiting a hundred different Earths. And I think that prepares us to be ready for the fact that Earth will be many different Earths over the course of our lifetimes in a way that no past generation uh, or past centuries generations were prepared to do. Do we want to talk about the term science fiction? Yes. Because yes, what I, what I, the reason I use the term science fiction is that that is the term that people who write science fiction used. It is an own voices term that was developed through various other terms uh, in the 1920s and 1930s to describe what it was the people were doing. Uh, it was scientifiction. Um, and sci-fi comes from scientifiction rather than science fiction. Um, but it was the term that they were using to name this new genre when it was an exciting new genre that was just conscious of itself. Uh, and it is the term that is generally still used. And while terms like speculative fiction and so on might be technically better terms if we were starting on an empty page, we're not starting on an empty page. Uh, and speculative fiction is usually used by literary writers who feel that they are slumming in our genre. Uh, particularly, it's been used a lot by Margaret Atwood, who, who swears she doesn't write science fiction when she's writing the most solidly science fictional things imaginable that could have been written by Greg Bear, right in the middle of the road of science fiction. And she says she's not writing science fiction, she's writing speculative fiction. So it's a, it's a term that uh, comes from outside, whereas science fiction is a term that comes from inside. Sometimes the term speculative fiction is useful for getting us into the umbrella of fantasy once fantasy is differentiated from science yeah. fiction, though it's important to remember that the formative moment of the pulp magazines in the early 20th century from which science fiction as a self-conscious genre is born are also printing some fantasy stuff and they're not differentiating heavily yeah. between the two. They are mixing together so that a, a story with dragons in it would be in a science fiction magazine for the earliest generations of what is self-consciously calling itself science fiction. We now recognize a lot of things as this is fantasy, this is science fiction, this is a mixture of both or an overlap. This is one of these rich things where we argue about which one it is. Um, but the two very much formed together in that moment of uh, the 1920s and 1930s. And it's not until later that people would understand you, even the publishers would understand you when you talk about a difference between science fiction and fantasy. But we think about there being a big difference between science fiction and fantasy, uh, for which the term speculative fiction is sometimes helpful in terms of encompassing both together. Um, 
which is to say we'll be talking about fantasy a lot in the course yeah. in as much as we're talking about the characteristics it shares with SF, the moments when the two blur, works that have elements of both, works that are about the fact that the two intermesh, that disguise themselves one as the other, uh, but also talking about what differentiates science fiction as it differentiates from fantasy and vice versa. Yeah, and I often use the term SF without defining it, because that means it can cover the broad science fiction, the broad speculative fiction, whatever you want it to mean, uh, as a as a term that that covers the field. And people sometimes use SFF or F and SF uh, to again encompass them. Uh, but they're they're yeah. genres that flow together, and it's always fun to look at what happens when genres flow together. I'm always comparing it in my mind to when I put on my historian hat uh, and I'm looking at 18th century stuff, uh, the flowing together of the genres of radical enlightenment for uh, philosophy and porn, which are totally kindred genres being written by the same people, published by the same publishers, and have crossovers in the fake form of things like de Sade's work or Diderot's uh, The Nun, which is the first lesbian novel in a lot of ways. Um, that they're being sold by the same publishers in the same, in that case, underground bookshops, and often purchased by the same communities that are interested in things that are transgressive. So even though it doesn't intuitively make sense to us that a philosophical dialogue on whether you can prove the existence of God and porn should have anything to do with each other, in the cultural milieu of that moment, it made sense. And similarly, you know, you could imagine an alternate universe in which fiction about robots and fiction about dragons develop wholly separate from each other without being associated with each other. And, and maybe the fiction about dragons would be more associated with, I don't know, romance literature and the fiction about robots would be associated with thriller literature or something and that they wouldn't have this symbiotic overlap. But because they crystallized as self-conscious genres eat together uh, in the same presses and same process and often consumed by the same readers at first, although this differentiates later in the latter half of the 20th century. They therefore have a lot of richness that comes from the dialogue between them and works that intentionally disguise one as the other or blur the two. And one of the things that's interesting when thinking about that is that relatively recently, like as recently as the 70s and 80s, there were very few books published that were science fiction or fantasy, and most of the readers would read all of them, whereas now you can just read in, in you can just read the ones you like. Okay, which is better. You can just read the ones that you like. But there was quite a long time when everybody was reading everything because there wasn't enough of the kind that you liked to keep you going if you if you read a lot, which a lot of fans uh, did and, and do, and I totally do. Um, and you just have to read everything because there wasn't enough. Because the the numbers that are published have absolutely exploded uh in in every decade i saw the question of whether the syllabus is available and the answer is the syllabus was going to have been available but i spent all morning wrangling with the process of getting a hold of scans of some of the unusual stuff so we are making a couple tweaks to it and we will indeed post it this afternoon uh, but we can give a verbal overview uh, of what we're looking at and where we're starting which is with voltaire uh, we're beginning with Microbegas, yeah. Voltaire's, it's technically a novelette, I believe, by, by length, uh, about an encounter with alien, an alien from near Saturn and an alien from the star Sirius who come to Earth and have a first contact experience interacting with people. Uh, and it's a fun example of how there is a lot of fiction set on imagined the moon or imagined made up place Gulliver's Travels, uh, Plato's Republic, Thomas More's Utopia, Lucian of Samosatra. Uh, we're using Voltaire as something of a sample of that. And uh, we'll talk about the ways in which it is or isn't more similar to modern stuff. Um, but a lot of what we're going to look at is the process of science fiction becoming self-conscious as a genre and as a community. So the first week we're going to be looking at early slash sort of pre-crystallization of the genre as a genre work 
uh, before we zoom in on how does this change from people are writing stories. Some of those stories are set on the moon. Some of those stories are not set on the moon. They're all published in the same ways and spread in the same manner to there is a thing that we call science fiction and books with these characteristics go in that category. Because, you know, there there's a category. And if things have robots and spaceships, they go in that category. There isn't a publishing category for books that happen to have cats in them, right? <laughs> Just some books in any given genre have cats in them and some books in any given genre don't have cats in them. You could imagine a world in which some books in any given genre have robots in them, but we don't have a name for that. Um, and why science fiction comes to be a named thing as opposed to scattered through the other contours of literature, which is what it was before the early 20th century, is a really fun question. Yeah, and, and a lot of it does have to do with the pulp magazines and Hugo Gernsback and then John Campbell and early editors sort of pulling it together and making it a thing um, with, with, as I said, an agenda of of educating people to live in the future and to have ideas about the future. So we'll be looking at, after looking at the, the prehistoric science fiction, uh, the science fiction that didn't know it was science fiction, mm -hmm. um, then we'll be looking at the, the golden age of science fiction when John W. Campbell was uh, publishing Astounding, and we'll be reading things from that era and uh, a bit after that. Era. Yeah, and then that's so that's, that's so week. Second yeah, week. so the second week, the first one for which you're doing a bunch of reading. Most of the reading for that weekend, for a number of them, is going to be short stories, since you get more samples of different stuff per page. So we've got a selection of different short stories from the Golden Age: Bester, Heinlein, Clark, Frederick Poole, Zena Henderson, uh, and uh, Asimov stuff. Uh, uh, in that week. And then the second week is it moving more toward becoming self-conscious as a genre, as opposed to conscious as a genre, meaning analyzing itself. Uh, we exist. Oh, now we have to you know, turn the mirror on ourselves and do self-examination. Uh, so the first full-length novel we're going to be reading is Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed in that, in week th uh, three. I think people are curious as to what the full length novels are that we're doing. Every week is going to have, you know, these are the things we're reading. And if you want to read more like this, here's the uh, yeah. extended recommendations. Uh, but for many of the weeks, it's going to be either a bunch of short stories or one novel accompanied by a couple of short stories. Um, so in the third, in the third week, we're reading The Dispossessed along with some uh, accompaniments. In the fourth week, we're reading Delaney's Triton. Um, do you want to say anything about that, Joe? That's the week called Sex, uh, etc. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, tr Triton and some other short works that are from the 70s when there started to be uh, an ability to talk about sex and uh, gender and race and all of these things uh, that had been sort of... Uh, dealt with in very clunky ways before that started to be uh, things that were considered to be of interest to the genre, the genre could turn its focus to them, sometimes in ways that now look clunky, but that were uh, nevertheless sort of uh, interesting and conscious and thought about uh, at, the, at the time. Um, and we'll also be looking with the comparison of those two when you've read them at uh, Utopia and Dystopia. Um, and, and the question of what, where dystopia falls in a relationship to science fiction as a genre, uh, where dystopia falls as a genre relative to it. Um, and then in week five, when we're looking at revitalization and re-examination of the genre, we're going to read C.J. Cherry's Citine. Which is a book about cloning and uh, slavery, it's cloning and unfreedom. Uh, and it's a, it's a really, really great book. It's a little bit long, but I think it's so rich that it'll really benefit from uh, 
examination in this kind of way. Um, and we're pairing that and actually a number of them yeah. with excerpts from Japanese stuff. So I also work on the Japanese world of anime and manga as well as science fiction. Uh, anime and manga is giant, giant medium that has every genre within it, right? There's romance and there's chick lit and there's thriller and there's cooking manga. Uh, but within that, there is a very important thread of science fiction stuff, which is Japan replying in this conversation to the anglophone science fiction that's being translated into Japanese. And one of the things that's very important to follow with the history of SF is that it, it's often this fascinating one-way conversation because anglophone SF from both the UK and the US gets translated into a bajillion other languages and published all over the place in Brazil and in China and in Korea and in France and in Italy. And people there write awesome science fictional replies, which almost never get translated back. So that there become all of these micro conversations all over the world in which the US is spreading out ideas, you know, robot laws, cloning, et cetera, and the UK is spreading them out as well. And then micro conversations develop within Japan, within Korea, within Italy, uh, within France, which have their own characteristics that we almost never get to see. There are rare moments like when uh, the Three Body Problem, which is the most celebrated Chinese science fiction novel, got translated into English. But that's rare. We're working on getting it less rare, uh, but 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 rare. And uh, so along one of the few types of SF that does tend to get translated from any other language into English is manga. Uh, because manga, for complicated reasons which you'll read about, became vogue in America. And so for decades, the only science fiction being written in other languages that you could get in English was manga, comic books, Japanese comic books. It was the one reply that managed to, to trickle back uh, in decades when nothing in prose was being translated into English from anywhere. Um, so it means we have a great window on what is happening in another country. And I'm not picking Japan because its science fiction tradition is more important. I'm picking Japan because its science fiction tradition is available in English and we can actually consume it. Uh, so in each of the weeks, we'll be looking at little excerpts from notable Japanese science fictional works that are in manga format, but are specifically responding to Asimov or specifically responding to the new wave, you know, feminist science fiction of the 60s and 70s, uh, or are specifically responding to some of the very sexual uh, turn of the uh, interest in, in in race and sexuality that comes in the, la the later 70s and so on, so that we can see those parallels of what happens when at least one other <laughs> language's culture gets a hold of what's being produced by the Anglosphere's science fiction and gets a chance to respond. Um, so those excerpts will accompany uh, all the way through as we see how another culture's science fiction tradition also transforms between the 1940s and the 19. 70s and indeed the uh, post-2000 wave. And right at the end, we're also going to be reading one story by Bao Shu, who is a Chinese writer who's really brilliant. It's a really brilliant story that has, interestingly, that story has only been published in English because of the political situation in China. So he couldn't publish it in Chinese, but only in English to speak back into the conversation here, but not into the conversation there. Because it is a conversation. And that's one of the things we really want to show with this is that it is a conversation and the kind of conversation that it is. Uh, and how it started off being a conversation that was really between white men and that has opened out and out and welcomed more people welcoming white women and then uh, Americans of all races and then even people in other countries. And that we started to see this sort of flowing back uh, and the conversation spreading more widely. Um, yeah, so our, our, our strand of manga within the braid will help us track that over time and track how other countries were producing SF in response to the English world, English speaking world, 
long before we had access to that or when it was very hard to get access to that and that that has been getting easier over time. Uh, could you, Joe, repeat the name of the story you just mentioned? Where is it? Um, it's right at the end of the week. What has passed oh, shall in kind, yeah. What yeah. has passed shall in kinder light appear by Bao Shu. Yeah. I will put that in the chat, but it's going to be on really the Canvas site shortly. We're getting every all the yeah. links up soon. Uh, where's the chat? It, it's a difficult title to uh, remember, but it's a really terrific story. Um, uh, we're also reading we've dense. To, yeah, I, I was going to say we've we've tried to go for things that are not only good examples of things, but also enjoyable to read, and in dialogue um, with each other. Uh, and so in dialogue with each other. Yeah. So that each of the novels is one that connects to themes of others. So Triton connects a lot to the dispossessed, for example. Uh, that yeah. pair together, um, and then we're reading Dan Simmons' Hyperion. Just one story from. Oh, okay, Hyperion. just one story from Hyperion. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. What's What's the main reading for week six? Right I now, it has sh short stories, and anyway, well, y'all have this <laughs> in a few hours. <laughs> We've been having to change it over and over because we're trying to focus on things that are easy to get a hold of, or in the case of things that are impossibly out of print, find ways to get them. Uh, we're reading part of a um, 1970s feminist science fiction manga called They Were Eleven, which is so rare that uh, there was a squabble between the U.S. publisher and the Japanese company, and the Japanese company actually forced the U.S. publisher to pulp the entire edition. So the only surviving copies are the 300 copies that they had sent out two weeks early uh, before the edition had to be physically destroyed. So, like, some of these are really hard to get a hold of, uh, but we're going to have them in scanned form as best we can. And then in the last week, Joe really, really wants yep. you to read my novels. So that yes. is what we're doing, even yes. though I feel self-conscious yes. about it. But. This, this, this course is, is uh, <laughs> the, the alternate title for this course is From Micromegas to Terry Ignota, uh, How to Read Science Fiction. Yes. So we start with Voltaire's very philosophical science fiction novella that actually is science fiction and end with reading Ada's absolutely brilliant Terra Ignota that, uh, that even for somebody who'd never read any science fiction, if you've read everything else that's on this syllabus, when you get to Terra Ignota, you're going to be able to read it. Um, uh, because it's not an easy thing to pick up from nowhere. The same goes for that uh, Bao Shu story. That is mm. a story that all of the short stories in the week before as well are things that you need to have come through uh, reading science fiction to get to the point where you can read those. Um, and uh, I was I was actually thinking about how to say this this morning uh, about Terra Ignota and why it's so interesting and such a great world and so so good and such a very good example for you to read of where science fiction is right now. Uh, and then I started thinking about it and I just went off into a reverie about what got put into a knapsack at one point in uh, book two. And uh, I, I didn't come up with anything sensible to say other than like, so good, it's so good, you've just got to read it. <laughs> um, but I think that we'll be able to have a very productive discussion. And we're also going to read it with Ada's essay about how she got it published. Mm. So you'll be able to have the experience of talking to a writer about how she published something that you've read. Uh, and why she made the choices that she made, which is something that people always want to ask. Um, why why you did these things. I'm I'm sharing some of the story lists from the not quite complete syllabus. I don't want people to go searching for these things yet. Uh, but I've discovered that they can fit in the chat okay. So for those who've been curious. Um, and much of the selection process focused on trying to prioritize things that you can get free online and things that are in close dialogue with each other. Uh, yes. Shadow of the Torturer, that's going to be great. Yeah, we're just reading a, an excerpt about a library. 
Uh, and Ada, do you want to talk a little bit about the format of the class or? Yes, yeah, so we, uh, these are going to be long meetings, but we'll divide them in half. And our plan is that the first half of each session will be splitting into groups for a smaller group discussion of what we read for that week. Um, so some people go with me, some people will go with Joe, depending on numbers, there might be a TA who takes a third section, will rotate around who's in which, so that the first half of classes is, is very active in, in the group uh, discussion of what we have just read for that week. And then the second half of each class will be me and Joe discussing and setting up the themes and stuff for the following week. So that we wrap up in the first half with the 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 excited discussion, and then the second half is the preparation for the following week. Um, and uh, Joe, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's what we agreed the format would be, and I think that'll work really well. And a lot of the it's it is an it's a fully course. online course. A lot of the things that we're getting you to read, particularly the more recent things, uh, are online. And sometimes they're online as a as a podcast uh, or something that you can listen to. But I figured that if you're interested in taking an online class, you don't mind listening to something. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but if that's a problem, I don't know. We'll get as much as we can in multiple formats. So in some cases, yes. there might be here's a web link and here's a downloadable PDF as well to make things easier. Yeah. Uh, do we want to transition to Q&A? Uh, yeah, we sort yeah, of I semi already I, have. I, yeah, I figured. Yeah, Zoe, can you? Minutes, so uh, <laughs> yeah. Zoe, can you pick out a couple of, of questions to suggest? Yeah, um, there were a couple of comments about the book We, the the Russian sci-fi. Ah, book. yes, uh, that's a. I was just thinking about that as we were talking because it's a great example of how hard it was to get a hold of stuff in translation. Uh, one of my favorite of George Orwell's essays is his essay complaining about how hard it was to get a hold of a copy of We. Uh, and all the different steps he went through to have to try to track it down. So for those who aren't familiar, this is the least famous of what I think of as the great trifecta of founding dystopia novels. It was actually what I wrote my first term paper about when I was a high school wow. student. And I made my first ever website about it. It was the only website about it because there was no Wikipedia yet. Um, so uh, we by Evgeny Zamyatin, who is a uh, was an enthusiastic revolutionary Bolshevik, a very idealistic, uh, and uh, describes in his autobiography that when he was a kid, he thrived at every subject but mathematics. So out of sheer stubbornness, he became an engineer. Uh, he went to to Britain where he did an engineering uh, uh, fellowship and was actually an engineer in. England during World War One, and we have his novel, The Islanders, which is a satire of what it was like as a Russian outsider to observe the activities of um, uh, of England during that. And then he was very, very disappointed by uh, the progress of the revolution back at home in Russia. And We is a, a, a profoundly interesting dystopian novel definitely weirdly between 1984 and Brave New World in that everyone is very controlled and very observed. Everyone lives in literal glass houses so you can see everyone else at all times. But it's also sort of weirdly serenely beautiful. And it's fascinating to see it fall in between. Uh, he wrote it after Huxley, but before Orwell. So Orwell did read it before writing 1984 and it's an important influence on it. So you can think of them as, as three steps that move together. Uh, Zamyatin eventually had to flee Russia and uh, lived the last decades of his life in exile in Britain. So a really fabulous uh, author and essayist. I want to add his essay tomorrow to our yes, uh, I was syllabus. just going to ask if we could do that, because mm -hmm. we, is, we is a great book, but it's incredibly depressing, and it's also <laughs> quite long. Mm -hmm. Um uh, and it can be supplementary reading, but it's not going to be core reading for this class. If we yeah. did one that was utopia and dystopia, it would be absolutely central. But that essay, oh, I think everybody mm. would read that. That's a yeah. wonderful essay. Yeah, I can um, also put in his letter to Stalin, which is just heartbreaking, which I work on in my censorship history hat. 
um, because he wrote a, a letter to Stalin about how he felt the um, revolution had been betrayed and, and protesting censorship. He's an incredible essayist. Uh, but we, we're, we're not doing very many full length novels total because we want to give you lots of different people. So we're doing lots of short stuff and lots of excerpts yeah. so that we can uh, have a wider variety of people. Uh, and a lot of them are uh, not the people you would name in your top 10 most famous SF writers, but who are in the, you know, the, the second 10 and third 10 and really important in their period. That's partly a uh, activist thing. One thing that happens in the history of literature generally, but certainly at SF, is that people of marginalized identities, uh, women, sexual minorities, racial minorities, tend to actually be there and be writing and be publishing and be read and then not make it into people's list of the year's best of or you know, anthology of what are the most essential readings. Uh, that it's often that there were, you know, women and people of color there, but it doesn't look from 20 years later as if there were, because none of their work made it out of the original publication into the republication, uh, into the collections that then become the anthologies. So we get this strange lens that makes it look as if there were was less diversity than there actually was. Uh, there still wasn't that much diversity, but there were always women publishing in these things, and then they vanish, not because they aren't there, but because they get weeded out or squeezed down to only the works about gender surviving. And this is, I'll hand this over to Joe in a second, but we we did a fun project that Joe spearheaded where we collected syllabuses from how many different science fiction classes, Kurt, recent courses oh, on science loads. fiction. It was over a hundred. It, it, it was about, Yeah. It was yeah. over 100 different science fiction classes to look at what they assigned that was written by women. And, and the, the, the vast majority, this was, this was in 2017, and I think it has actually slightly improved since I did this, mm. uh, but the vast majority had two books by women, and one of them was Frankenstein. And the other one was inevitably The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin, which is a great book. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. But it was always The Left Hand of Darkness, which is the book that is about gender. And it was never The Dispossessed, which is also a brilliant, brilliant book. Those two are her two greatest books. You would expect in a reasonable world that they'd be half the time one would be assigned and half the time the other would be assigned if you were teaching Le Guin. But no, it was always the left hand of darkness because that was when they could do gender week. They could do we're reading a book by a woman this week and it's about gender because women do gender. And next week we're back to the real thing. Um, we, we did that. That's done. And that is sort of so mm. very the case. Mm. Yeah. The, it's, it's not funny. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and readings of Frankenstein get more and more gendered as well over time with this weird <laughs> women only write about gender pattern that pe that isn't true, uh, but that becomes true on syllabuses. <laughs> and similarly, uh, Octavia Butler's book that is assigned when anything is assigned is always Kindred. Because Kindred is front and central about race and slavery in America. And Kindred is, is brilliant and powerful. Um, but Octavia Butler wrote a lot of books and they're all good, you know, and, and interesting. Um, we're going to be looking at the novella Blood Child, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, is is really great. But if we had all the time in the world and if you were prepared to read seven books every week, then we could have <laughs> a really great syllabus here. <laughs> but uh, as it is, we're trying to keep it to a manageable amount. And we've, we've tried to do a list of supplementary reading for every week of other things that you can read or you could read afterwards or if you wanted to read more stuff it'll be out there and there's a lot of really major important writers who are only on that supplementary list because we're trying to limit it to what you can actually reasonably read yes and i know we're running up on uh, our time limit but uh just oh. one quick question uh in terms of the the level of the course someone asks is if if you're not an experienced sci-fi writer reader is is yeah. that an issue i i wouldn't think so but i figured i'd let you if you 
if you're prepared to actually do the reading and think about it, you don't have to be an experienced sci-fi reader. But equally, if you are an experienced science fiction reader, and I recognize some of the names in the chat as people <laughs> who are very experienced science fiction readers, Paula Lieberman is right there. Um, if you are, I don't think it'll be boring. Um, you might have read a lot of the stuff before, but you won't have read all of it, probably, because nobody's read everything, uh, mm -hmm. certainly not of recent things. Um, and I don't think it'll be dull for somebody who already knows a lot, but I don't think it has requirements for somebody who doesn't know anything. And in each week, we're going to have one of the essays we've been working on together about the history of the genre and craft of writing, looking at things like uses of narrators, uh, complicity of with the reader, uh, publishing history. So even so, if things are unfamiliar, those essays will help give you a lens and a sense of what to look for while reading. If the things are familiar the essays will still give you a lens and perhaps make your reread as you revisit a familiar work be focused in a new way thanks to that framing and also the other works that it's paired with because even if you've already read all 11 short stories that we're reading in week seven you haven't read all of those short stories together and thought about them as a set uh, and how they are specifically in dialogue with each other and not other things. So the juxtaposition should be ideal for people for whom this is an intro, but still rich for people for whom this is a uh, experienced thing. Yeah. And the essays are going to be published as a collection called Integral to the Plot, which will be out from Tor uh, early in uh, 2024. Um, the the they're a thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. Well, I know I hate to wind this up because this has just been so wonderful to listen to this conversation. I mean, if, uh, te if technology will allow, I'm happy to linger another five or 10 minutes to answer sure. a couple more questions if people Okay, well, I, I just want to let people so. know I am going to uh, stop the recording. And uh, if people do have to leave, they can leave. If people would like to stay and uh, ask a couple more questions, we can certainly stay on for a little bit more longer. So. Uh, let me go ahead and stop the recording now. And